This program is brought to you by Emory University. Thank you for that very, uh, very nice introduction, uh, Dr. Cornell, and I want to uh, thank everyone for coming here. Uh, my name is Dino Jalal, and you're right, uh, Holly, we just had very good discussions with President uh, James uh, Wagner, uh, and uh, uh, I appreciate the longstanding cooperation between Emory University and uh, Indonesia. Uh, I want to thank uh, all of you for coming. Uh, let, let me just acknowledge my Indonesian fellows who are here today and ask them to stand up. Uh, can I ask uh, Robert, Fifi, and every Indonesian in this room to stand up? Good. Uh, hi, how are you? Good, good to see you. Good. Uh, and let me also introduce my Consul uh, General, um, uh, Mr. Al Bushra. He's a sitting right down there. A uh, pleasant surprise is uh, seeing uh, an old friend. I came here 30 years ago and studied in New York. Uh, I didn't speak uh, English very well back then. And now my uh, close friend, best friend from that uh, college days uh, are here. Michael Manutrizio is standing right in front of me. <laughs> and actually, uh, when I arrived here, the guy with the white shirt, I smacked him in the head thinking that was Michael. <laughs> and <it's, laughs> You know, you all look the same from behind, right? <laughs> but you know, the, the, the pleasant thing and surprising thing about Michael is not that I found him in Atlanta, but the fact that uh, he has now a job. Right? <laughs> so congratulations, Mark. Yeah, he works for Delta, and he's been uh, very, very nice to me, uh, not because I'm now the ambassador, but because uh, Tomorrow I'm meeting the CEO of uh, Delta, which is his boss. So he's got to be very, very nice to me. And by the way, I'll mention about that race to him that uh, he, he, he's talking about. Um, uh, but Mike, Mike is equally surprised to see me uh, becoming ambassador because, and, and this is not a joke, I was actually a dishwasher at the embassy where I'm now ambassador in 1979. I worked at the basement, I was the dishwasher, and then I was promoted to janitor. And then, uh, Somehow, 30 years later, I became ambassador. So America is really the place where dreams come true, you know. <laughs> uh, uh, a black kid who studied in Indonesia can become president of the United States. The Argentinian basketball team can beat the American basketball team in the Olympics. Chris Humphrey can find true love and marry Kim Kardashian. And a dishwasher at the Indonesian embassy can become ambassador at the embassy. So the American dream. Uh, I've been here 11 months now. I came, I think, in uh, September uh, last year, and uh, already, you know, my most memorable moment is not really meeting with the many congressional people or senators. My most mem memorable moment was a few months ago when I was invited to a BET uh, award in LA, and then uh, I came across, guess who? Justin Bieber. <laughs> <laughs> I went to him, you know, and I said to him, with the ambassadorial dignity, Mr. Justin Bieber, my name is Dino Jalal, the ambassador of the Republic of Indonesia. I want to thank you for coming to my country and perform, you know. And his response was, right on, dude. He, he gave me a knucklehead, you know. <laughs> now, I told that story to my child. I got three kids, four, five, and six. And for the whole month after that, they all listened to me because they thought I was really special and God-like for having spoken to, to Justin uh, Bieber. <laughs> By the way, uh, thanks for mentioning about uh, the 500 uh, influential Muslims that I was uh, enlisted in. Uh, I remember my staff came in and he said, boss, I got good news and bad news. What's the good news? I said, well, you have been, uh, your name has been mentioned among the, one, among the 500 most influential Muslims in the world. And I said, well, that's nice. What's the bad news? You're number 500. <laughs> So it's not very good for my ego. <laughs> you, you probably are wondering why I'm telling all these jokes, and, and the reason is that I fell asleep last night and forgot to write my speech for today. <laughs> no, just kidding. But you know, Americans are really nice. Uh, I remember when I was political counselor uh, 12 years ago in, in Washington, D.C., they sent me to Rochester, and I, I was giving a speech on Indonesia. I arrived at the hotel, I went up, fell asleep, and then the phone rang and said, sir, we're all waiting for you in this room. Please come downstairs. So I rushed downstairs, put on my jacket, and I went to the reception. I said, I'm Dino Jalal. I'm ready to give my speech. And the people at the reception says, go right ahead. So I went up there to the podium, gave a long speech about Indonesia, very passionate. 
And then at the end, when I finish, I ask them if there's any question. And somebody in the audience asks, uh, yes, who the hell are you? <laughs> and apparently I went to the wrong room and I gave a speech to the Rochester Senior Golfers Association. <laughs> And Americans are so nice, they just listen, you know. They didn't say, get off the stage. They say, they listen, you know. So uh, yeah. I made sure I didn't make that same mistake. Uh, look, I just arrived from Austria, uh, and we had discussions with a number of uh, uh, politicians and diplomats and, and journalists. And uh, there was a point in that discussion that a Scandinavian politician uh, talked about what was happening in Norway. And the message was that uh, young people in Norway were joining politics in droves. You know, there's something tremendous uh, happening. Uh, after the massacre by Andre Breivik, uh, the young Norwegians were thinking, perhaps the world is not as we think it is. Perhaps we were too spoiled in our home, and perhaps we should do something about it. And that's spurring a new phenomenon of young people entering into uh, politics. And I think this is important because this is related to what I would say the two twin elements of survival, progress, and transformation for all nations, not just for Norwegians or Americans, Indonesians, but for all nations. One is the ability to seize opportunity, and secondly, the ability to recognize threats. Now, you look at how countries transform going from one level to the next or going down from one level uh, to the one below is because they fail to do both. You know, Indonesians, uh, we recognize what the threats were centuries ago, which was colonialism, but we fail to seize opportunities. And as a result, for centuries, Indonesia was colonized and our people suffered. Uh, Lebanon and Cambodia, these are two countries in the Middle East, another one in Asia, they were considered the Switzerland of Asia. Uh, they had reached the height of their uh, progress, but one time or another, they failed to seize opportunity and they failed to recognize threats, and we know uh, the historical troubles that they experience after that. I think even in America, this is a question that you must answer. You know, how do you seize the threats how do you recognize the threats that are before you, and how do you seize the opportunities that are out there? And this ability to seize opportunity and repel threats are critical because we are all engaged in a battle for the soul of humanity. And this is something that's going on globally, regionally, nationally, locally, and even individually in our hearts. Uh, this is a battle for the soul of humanity and a battle that involves forces of moderation against forces of extremism. Forces of inclusion versus forces of exclusion. Forces of democracy versus forces of authoritarianism. Forces of freedom against forces of tyranny. And this is a battle that constantly asks you and me, what does it mean to be an Indonesian today? What does it mean to be an American today? What does it mean to be an Egyptian today? a Libyan or a Tunisian. <coughs> and it also asks what it means to be a Muslim in the 21st century and what it means to be a Jew and a Christian in the 21st century. Now, in the 21st century, the battle for the soul of humanity around the world is being waged in a terrain full of challenges. Now, let me talk a bit about what are these new challenges in the new terrain. Uh, one would be the fact that the middle class is going to grow phenomenally. Uh, the Economist has, has already said that the middle class accounts for loosely defined half of the world population, and this is a trend that will continue. I think in the next three generations or four generations, we will come close to a condition of zero poverty, and that is not utopia. Connectivity. Uh, I predict that in the next <coughs> two generations, the whole world will be wired. We're already there. Indonesia, for example, is already the second largest Facebook user uh, uh, in the world. But this is something that is going to change society and change <coughs> humanity. Globalization will continue to spread, and there's nothing you and I can do to stop it. 
uh, and the change in the 21st century will be greater than the change in previous centuries. They say even uh, the change that will happen in the 21st century is equal to 20,000 years of normal human progress. Modernization will continue, but this will not lead to happy ending necessarily because modernization and development will contrib contribute to inequity, scarcity, dislocation, <coughs> marginalization, and even new problems and new conflicts. Emerging powers will multiply. You see a lot, you hear a lot about Brazil, Indonesia, Turkey, South Africa, Nigeria, India, China, and the likes. Believe me, in the next generation or two, this will multiply, and it's gonna change the weight of the world. It's gonna change the system. America probably will be the, still the, the only superpower in the short and medium term, but it will operate in an entirely new and different strategic environment. The youth uh, will become a new phenomenon in national and international uh, affairs. Uh, the youth of today, I think, is the most progressive youth ever known in human history. The youth today, both in developed and developing countries, are more open, they're less dogmatic, less ideological, they're more cosmopolitan, they have more skills, and they have what we call transgenerational consciousness, you know, as opposed to 20th century class consciousness. Uh, today, the youth uh, can identify across political borders and develop this unique phenomenon of transgenerational consciousness. And because of that, they're becoming much more superior agents of change. Human nature in the 21st century will also change. Uh, I hate to admit it with my wife, but uh, I can leave my wife for a week on trips and be all right about it. But you take my Blackberry for one hour, something <laughs> is missing, right? You don't like to admit it. I don't tell my wife this. Please don't tell her I said that. But it's true, human nature is changing. And people say with the disconnectivity, we feel closer to people who are far away because we are texting all the time than people who are right next door. But you know, human nature is changing. You know, they, you know, they say that uh, humanity starts behaving differently with the invention of the clock because <coughs> with the invention of the clock, you start eating regularly three times a day, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. That's only one invention. Imagine all this technology, how it will impact on human nature. <coughs> and of course, resources will be a key factor in international relations. You will see a lot more resources competition in the world, especially water. Water is already a luxury. In, clean water is already a luxury in many places on Earth today. And in the coming generation or two, they will become a strategic commodity. The one constant that I hope will not change is the number of countries around the world. Now, why do I say that? Uh, look, the, 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 the most tangible change in the 20th century is how countries evolve and multiply. You know, uh, at the, after World War II, there were only about 50 countries that were be, uh, members of the United Nations. And now we have 198 countries, if I'm not mistaken. Right? Now, that happened, that was one of the most important change of geopolitical map in the 20th century. It can't happen in the 21st century. The multiplication of these countries. We can't go from 198 to 600 countries. Why? Because we will have World War III, a lot of wars, a lot of sufferings, right? So I think the one constant that we have to see is this number more or less the same. Perhaps, and hopefully, Palestine uh, will uh, join that. And perhaps uh, Kosovo is already uh, joining that, but not a lot more than that, because a lot more than that means global instability, uh, which we cannot uh, afford. But the one big question, and this is what I want to talk to you about today, the one big question for us is what will happen to religions, cultures, and civilizations? In 1993, Samuel Huntington, uh, the late Samuel Huntington, uh, came up with his notion or theory of clash of civilizations, and he argued and he warned, he wasn't calling for it, but he warned that international politics after World War II would be colored by these identity, civilizational differences, and that the biggest cause for conflict would come from the lines of civilizations, uh, religions. And he pointed to the potential of Islam 
versus the West as the biggest source of that conflict in the international system. Now, uh, that's about 16 or 17 years ago. And what do we have now? I mean, this is, uh, some people are allergic to what Samuel Huntington was saying, but I was never allergic to it. I took it in good spirit. I took it as a good warning of what we should avoid. Yeah, he wasn't calling for it. Yeah, he wasn't propagating it, but he was warning us, uh, and especially policymakers, of what we should look out for. And certainly, this is what we see around the world, these conditions that we should take note of. We see, for example, rising religiosity around the world. You know? uh, and I don't have to give you statistics, but in my home, you know, my mom uh, was a poor woman and he be she became a successful real estate uh, uh, broker. She did very well and she becomes more religious. And there's a lot of people in the middle class, upper class, and even uh, uh, lower economic class uh, who are becoming more religious. And I think this is a trend worldwide, not just in Indonesia, but whether you're Muslim, Christians, or Jews, you see rising religiosity in the 21st century. And this, is, uh, this repels uh, some who say that the more modern you become, the less religious uh, you become. You know, it, it's not true. It's the other way around, I think. Right? Uh, you also see a trend whereby Islam is growing, uh, my religion. Uh, it is predicted by one estimate that Islam will become the largest religion due to demographic changes. Uh, largest religion by 2025. There are now about 1.3 billion Muslims around the world. By 2025, 30%, it is estimated, of the world population will, become, will be uh, Muslims. And the question is, what kind of Islamic world will it be? What kind of Muslims will they be? And we're also seeing rising pockets or trends of intolerance around the world. I see it in Indonesia. I see it in America. I see it in Europe, in India, in Pakistan. You see pockets of tolerance, intolerance growing. You know? uh, and the message is message of hatred, message of exclu exclusivity, uh, and message of uh, conflict. And in, uh, uh, in line with that, we have the certainty that radicalism will grow. It's a certainty. You know, uh, in some places, radicalism is small. In other places, it's sizable. But uh, without going into details of why we, are, we need to embrace to a world where radicalism will grow. In Indonesia, we've been surprised by how many new strains of radical groups come out before we even know it. You know, we had no idea where these groups come from. Uh, where they emerge, but they're there and they're growing in strength. In, although they're small, but they're growing, right? And I think this is something that we should uh, look at for. And this radicalism will not be confined only to poor societies, but also to the middle class and even uh, the, 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 the upper class, right? So with all this, I think the question that we need to ask 17 years after Samuel Huntington came up with his thesis the question is, what will the future be? Will the future be a continuation of the typical patterns of past, or will it be an entirely new relationship based on forward-looking approach and peaceful harmony? <coughs> Those are the questions. What are the path? That way or a different way? And this question is particularly relevant to the relationship among Abrahamic religions of Islam, Judaism, and Christianity. Because among the Abrahamic religions, there has never been, and I stand to be corrected on this, a century where there is total peace between the three Abrahamic religions. Can the 21st century be different? Can it break that path of the past, a path of division? and conflict and clash between the Abrahamic religions. And I would argue that in the 21st century, we can. We can have not clash of civilizations, but confluence of civilizations, of cultures. We can, right? We see it here in America, right? We see it, you are the living example of this. And I would argue that it can be happened. It can be seen and it can be transplanted globally as well. It's not gonna be easy, but it can be done. And this is important 
because this relates precisely to the topic that I mentioned earlier, which is the battle for the soul of humanity. Right? This conflict has to take place, has to win. Right? And how do you make it win? I would propose we make it win by employing what I would call the technology for peace. Right? What are the elements or the weapons of the technology for peace? There are many, but let me propose several. One is multiculturalism. Multiculturalism. I was in 1979 uh, when I first uh, met Mike and was making fun of my accent. <laughs> right? But you know, if you ask me as an ambassador today, what is the most fundamental and radical transformation of America? What would it be? I would say one how multiculturalism has become a living reality. You know, in the 70s, it wasn't like that. You know, when I watched TV shows, you couldn't see a black and white couple on a TV soap opera. You know that, yeah? Uh, uh, racial tensions was qu quite strong. <coughs> uh, back then, ethnicity differences were not as celebrated as it is today. But I think America, uh, the, the one thing uh, one of the best things that you can project to the world is how much multiculturalism has taken root and transformed the face of America and how you embrace this, you know. Uh, and this is something that uh, not, uh, it's not easily happened in all countries. You know, very few countries you can see this uh, happening and flourish just like you see uh, in America. Uh, I note that German Chancellor Angela Merkel had complained recently uh, in the midst of her frustration that multiculturalism uh, is failing, she says, you know, because she's seeing events in Europe and other places. Uh, perhaps, you know, in some places it's not doing very well, but we cannot uh, let go of this trend and we have to all actively push the trend, the positive trend of multiculturalism. The second weapon in the technology for peace is moderation, right? Why moderation? Because moderates, unlike radicals, are naturally open-minded. They are peaceful, they are reasonable, and they are predisposed to dialogue, consultation, outreach, and understanding. That's what makes a moderate, moderate, right? And this is important because if you ask me, the conflicts today, you look at the newspapers, you can get confused. But it's not between Islam and Christianity. It's not between the Muslims and the Jews, you know. It's not. The conflict is between the radicals and the moderates. And they're radicals in Muslim, in Islam. They're radicals in Christianity. We saw Andrew Brevik, uh, what he did in Norway. They're radicals in uh, they're radical Jews as well, right? And what you need to do is seize a situation whereby there will be a coalition among the moderates. Coalition among moderate Muslims, coalition among moderate Christians and moderate Jews to face and push back the radicals, the radical Jews, radical Christians, radical Muslims, right? And this is the coalition that you need to build. And the moderates, what they need to do is be militant about their moderation. Now, why do I say this? Because I see too many incidents, including in my own country, whereby you see a bomb explode and the moderate will say something. That's very bad. We're against violence and terrorism. And you see the second and third and fourth bomb explode, the voice of the moderates die down bit by bit, right? Until in the end, when they see the 10th of 11th bomb, you hear almost silence because they think it happened so many times when what we say doesn't really make a difference anymore, right? And I say that's a wrong approach. Moderates must be militant. When I say militant, I don't mean violent, but must be passionate and at all times defend their moderation and push back when radicals try to take over the mainstream, right? So moderate must be passionately militant in defending their uh, moderation and never let their guard uh, down. And moderates must be empowered because in many places you see there are a lot of moderates, but they are not empowered. They don't have the voice that they should have. They don't speak up as much as they should. And they don't have the political representation that they need to make that difference. 
The third weapon is, again, this sounds cliche, but it is so real, education, right? Uh, education, you know, tolerance is a key thing in Indonesia, but tolerance has to be educated in Indonesian homes and Indonesian schools. Uh, in Indonesia recently, I look at my nephew's homework, and the homework asks questions. Um, my nephew is Muslim. The question was, you have a Christian neighbor. The Christian neighbor is celebrating Christmas. What do you do? And you have two answers. You ignore, you play basketball, or you come by and you bring gifts and celebrate Christmas with your neighbors. You know, questions like this are inculcated and taught in schools, right? So education is very important in how uh, you uh, win this battle for the soul. And what is also little appreciated is education of women and the role of mothers. Uh, in <coughs> there have been studies, and this is something that we in Indonesia know very well as well. Uh, if there is a child with radical tendencies, and the father is very extremist, espouses hate, hatred and violence, but the mother is peaceful, moderate, uh, and you know, religious in a good way, the child, in most cases, will be safe from a life of terrorism and radicalism, and will follow the mother's influence. Right? So education woman is something that has been missing in much of the Islamic world, and we're trying to restore that, and something that has been also missing in much of the developing world. And people are starting to realize, both in economics, microcredit, in banking, in the fight against poverty, uh, and development and modernization, women and the education of women are the key to progress and uh, peace. That's why I, I think that the, the decision to award Muhammad Yunus Nobel Peace Prize was the right on uh, decision. And the next woman is tolerance. Now, what do I say this? Uh, I've been in America long enough and have enough American friends that uh, I know the American mantra is freedom. You know, everywhere you go, the speech is all about freedom domestically and internationally. And I agree freedom is very important. But outside America, freedom alone is not enough, right? Freedom, unless coupled with tolerance, <coughs> will not produce the peaceful society and progressive society that you seek, right? Uh, and this is why my advice to all my American friends, I tell them this very openly, wherever you are, wherever you try to promote American values, you're crying mantra. Uh, war, war cry should not be just about freedom, right? In different places, freedom doesn't mean the same as it sounds here, right? It should be freedom plus tolerance, and that is very important. Now, uh, in the Indonesia context, I would advise that tolerance is something that you should never take for granted. There can be no such thing as too much harmony. You know, why do I say this? Because in Indonesia, we have communities, for example, in Poso and Maluku, where for centuries Muslims and Christians were living side by side. And one night, we don't know how, we don't know why, they became sworn enemies and killed each other like crazy, right? Overnight, after centuries of living in harmony, right? And that's when it reminded us that tolerance anywhere in the world and harmony should never be taken for granted. There's never too much. There's never such a thing as too much harmony and too much uh, uh, tolerance. And the last thing that I think is very important as a weapon of peace is what I would call either courageous innovation or innovative courage. And I know it sounds fancy, but I'll tell you what it means. And this is not easy. This is about an ability to chart a new path for the future and let go of your baggage, of your historical, ideological, mental baggage, and apply pioneerism. You know, a pioneer is somebody who breaks a new path forward. You know, somebody who thinks differently, takes the risk, sees the world in a different way, and creates a new uh, path. Now, why do I say that is important? Uh, you know, I went, I'm a Muslim and I went to an Islamic school and I remember my teacher, Islamic teacher, was telling me about conflicts 
between Muslims and Christians centuries ago, you know, 12 centuries ago, or conflicts between Muslims and Jews centuries ago. Right? And me being the stupid student that I was, I asked, you know, good stories, sir. Look, I don't even transplant the conflicts of my grandfather with his neighbors to my life today. What relevance does the conflicts that our ancestors had 12 centuries ago, 10 centuries ago, have to do with my life today? And why do I need to duplicate it? Right? And the bigger question is, why can't we reverse the process? Right? Rather than taking their fight, their conflict 12 centuries ago into our lives today, why can't we make our life today the model by which, in fact, we can be their inspiration <laughs> yeah. uh, to the kind of life and relations that they aspire to be, which is a peaceful, harmonious uh, life uh, and relations among uh, communities. So that takes a different kind of mindset, a different kind of pioneering mindset. You respect the, your faith, you respect the heritage, but you think forward and you think the future is yet to be written and you're willing to write it with courage. This is why I call it innovative courage and courageous uh, innovation. And this is what we're seeing, we're seeing now. You know, in the Islamic world, for example, scholars are beginning to find what are the elements of compatibility between Islam and democracy. Right? That's a new thing. Yeah? Uh, Islam has been, uh, in the Quran, there's a lot of verses. Yeah? And these verses have been used to guide a lot of political, social, and cultural uh, you know, uh, life. Right? But has anyone really deeply discussed what are the verses in Quran that support a democratic nationhood? Right? And this is a new era. Uh, scholars are starting to look into this, you know, the verses in Islam that support Islam and democracy in the 21st century can be compatible. They may not be compatible in the 19th century, may not be compatible in the 17th or 16th century, but they can be compatible in the 21st century. That's pioneerism, right? Uh, I was very much honored to meet the head of uh, uh, Islamic Society of North America, ISNA, uh, Dr. Said Shed, uh, I think he's a Pakistani, and he wrote a Muslim code of honor for Muslims in America, right? And he says, there's the Quran, there's the Hadith, the sayings of Prophet Muhammad and other things, but hey, why don't we try, based on those, to develop a Muslim code of honor, where there are uh, things such as mutual understanding, respect for a difference of opinion, peace, and nonviolence are uh, embedded in this Muslim code of honor. Again, it's something new. It wasn't there before, but he thought forward and he pioneered uh, that. Uh, Islam and globalization. You know, I completely disagree with Osama bin Laden and Taliban who think that the glory of Islam is to bring it back uh, seven centuries from now, which is, you know, the height of Islamic civilization is 13th century. I disagree. I would say that's backward looking. If you want Islamic Renaissance, you can reclaim it in the 21st century. And you reclaim it not by being exclusive, right? Not by being afraid of globalization, but by being open and embracing globalization and by embracing uh, other cultures, religions, and civilizations, right? But this is what pioneering approach is all about. It's a contextual approach. It's not a textual approach, right? And it is forward looking rather than backward looking. And I'm glad to say, not just within Islam, but in the relationship between Abrahamic religions, you're beginning to see this. You know, I mentioned to uh, you earlier about Dr. Shed Muhammad, uh, Shed Said uh, in Washington, D.C. He did something quite interesting. You know? What he did was he had this Congress of Islamic Society of North America. This is like 250,000 people. They do it once a year. You know? And then one day he had a crazy idea. You know? What was it? Why don't we invite the Jewish rabbi, the leader of the Jewish Congress, I forget what it's called, to address our Congress. 
And the members of Islam were like, no, what are you doing? This had never been done before. And when this was communicated to the Jewish rabbi, Jewish rabbi said, no, what's going on? I've never done this before, you know, why? Okay, but he persisted. He said, this is a good thing. So Jewish rabbi from the, uh, I forget what is the name of the organization, but it's the National uh, you know, uh, Jewish uh, Congress, came address for the first time in history in America, this Congress of Islamic Society of North America. And guess what? He received a standing applause. His message was well done, welcome. And guess what? The next time the Jewish Congress held their convention, they invited the leader of the Islamic Congress to address them, right? And at that time, again, the Jewish organization said, no, what's going on? This has never been done. Let's try it. They tried it, and guess what? It went very well. Uh, a good uh, response, good applause, uh, and this is something that they've been doing together, and including um, to Christian uh, conventions, right? Again, he's not tied to the past, right? He sees the future, and he wants to write it, and that's pioneerism. Uh, I received Rabbi Schneier from New York uh, the other day in my office, and he says they're doing something new. I said, what is it? He said, we're doing twinning of mosques and synagogues. What does that mean? Twinning means we identify mosques in New York and synagogues in New York, and when they pray, we get an Islamic ustad, cleric, to address the synagogue, and in the uh, mosque, we get the rabbi to address the uh, Islamic crowd, uh, Islamic uh, jamaah. And uh, this is done in hundreds of locations, this twinning, something new, something that is not necessarily done in other countries, right? But you see the point that I'm trying to make. You know, you think outside the box, you become forward-looking, and you see that you can change the world and change relations among Abrahamic religions. And this is why I was so uh, touched when I heard uh, President James Wagner told me that in the month of Ramadan on Fridays in Emory University, you have a call of prayer, uh, Islamic prayer, to be heard uh, in school. That is enormous and significant gesture. You know, I have a Twitter, by the way. I have 60,000 followers on my Twitter. I'm going to tweet about this today because everybody should know uh, about this. And again, uh, not just in Emory, but anywhere this is done, you should not feel shy or defensive. You should be very proud and open uh, 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 about it. And this is why I think one of the areas of cooperation between Indonesia and America is really in the field of multiculturalism, promoting tolerance and harmony uh, in the international system. You know, both Indonesia and America are multicultural countries. Uh, we have freedom and religion in both, uh, and it is significant that America is a superpower, you know, a Western, uh, what do you call it, uh, 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 major nation. Indonesia is a country with the largest Muslim population in the world. So the synergy that can be created by the two countries working together to promote multiculturalism and uh, religious pluralism is, is very significant. And, and this is why we work together, for example, not many people know this, Indonesia and America work together to promote G20, right? Because when G7 and G8 were losing steam and we realized we have to remake the world, there were two models. First model was the G13, right? I forget what the countries, but you know, I don't, I have short memory. But it's about five more countries, Mexico, I think South Africa, if I'm not mistaken, Brazil, and so on and so on. So from G7, G8, and then to G13. And Indonesia said, no, 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 no. Yeah, you know, we, didn't, we don't like that, you know. We want G20, right? So uh, my president called President Bush, and then there were a lot of calls with uh, Prime Minister Howard Keating, and we all lobbied like hell. And finally, we got not G13, but alhamdulillah, we got G20. You know why it's important to us? Because the G13 would have no Islamic civilization. The G20 would have an economic power structure that has three uh, 
nations with Islamic heritage, Indonesia, Turkey, and Saudi Arabia, right? And this is good for what I said to you, the Abrahamic religions and the confluence of civilization, which is reflected in the global economic decision making. And I think it's very important for America to keep this outreach. You know, President Barack Obama's speech at the Cairo and in Indonesia and other places has been very much welcome. Uh, he's sending an ambassador or special envoy to the OIC for the first time. It's uh, very much welcome. Uh, I would hope that uh, Americans would do uh, a, a special push to ensure that Muslims are embraced and included in the MDGs, which is 2015, and because there's too many Islamic communities that are marginalized still uh, in the efforts to find uh, the Millennium Development Goal by 2015. And I hope uh, Indonesia and America can intensify cooperation on interfaith uh, harmony. So let me close by saying that, you know, in the 20th century, there was plenty of you know, us and them, you know. Uh, I certainly grew up in that kind of environment. Even nationally, you know, there was a lot of us and them, you know. And uh, regionally and internationally, we saw a lot of that too. But I think what we should work on is the notion of the new we rather than us and them. And it's much more difficult to craft, right? But I think that is the challenge of our generation. As we commemorate 9-11, uh, a few days from now, me and Mike, we had a friend who lost his life uh, in 9-11, uh, Mike Carlo, you remember? Uh, he was my roommate uh, in New York, and he was a fireman, and we heard that the tower uh, uh, came down. Uh, no, he didn't hear. When he heard that there was a plane crash, uh, he went to uh, the Twin Towers. His brother was off duty, right? Uh, Rob was off duty. Uh, Rob was getting ready to, to, to help as well, but Mike was there first. And just when he arrived and he went to the buildings, the buildings uh, collapsed, right? So uh, he survived by his mom and uh, Rob, uh, our, our best friends. And uh, you know, I went to his funeral. So 9-11 yeah, is something personal to, to me uh, as well, you know. Uh, but I remember when 9-11 happened, I was in Washington, D.C., you know. Yeah. Everybody, every American called somebody. You remember that, right? You called uh, your, your parents, you called your family members, you called your neighbors, you called your friends, old friends, and you just told them, look, you know, how are you, you know? You just want to send them some love, you know? Because uh, that's one time that you're reminded of the bond of decency and, and, and humanity between, uh, between all your connections, you know? And you will do the same, I think. Uh, this year, yeah. you make some calls and you know, uh, you'll talk to your friends about uh, how things have changed, how things have not changed uh, in the past uh, 10 years. But as you try to reach out, uh, let me remind you that the shortest distance between two people is not the telephone, uh, it's not the email, even though it takes one second of delivery to send an email to anyone, anywhere in the world. The shortest distance between any people anywhere is prayer, right? Prayer, right? It's not fancy, right? It's not techno savvy. It's old, but it's the truth, right? And on the eve of September 10th this year, I will pray for my Islamic brothers and sisters, but I will also pray for my Christian fellows, my Jewish friends, my Buddhist and Hindu colleagues, and all the other children of God. And I will pray, and I hope we will all pray, that the 21st century will be, if we work at it, a century of peace and confluence among nations. Amen. Thank you. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.